Um, thanks so much, Jess, for that introduction. Um, uh, hands up here, who knows Tableau software at all? Okay, quite a few people, great. So I won't explain so much what that is. Um, as Jess said, I'm part of Tableau Software, which is a data visualization and visual analytics company. And I work with Tableau Public. If you are familiar with Tableau at all, Tableau Public is its free version of the software, but also its cloud-free, cloud-hosted platform where people can publish their data visualizations that they want to share with the world up. And then it's kind of like YouTube. You grab the embed code and you can embed it in a different website. So I spend most of my time working with nonprofits, bloggers, and journalists. And that's why I'm here to talk to you about data storytelling, because I spend a lot of my time looking at data stories and less of my time looking at traditional corporate metric dashboards. Although I think lots of those dashboards could use a bit of storytelling as well. So I'm going to go through and explain a little bit about what data storytelling is and hopefully show you guys that no matter where you work or what software or what tools you work with, if you have information you need to communicate with other people or even communicate with your future self, using some data storytelling techniques, some data narrative techniques, it's a really great way to make people be able to understand and grasp what you're trying to show with your information. So to start with, what is storytelling? Storytelling at the moment is a bit of a catchword. It's a bit of a buzzword within the, the data community. And because of that, I, I feel it's causing a bit more controversy than I think it should. Some people are really pro storytelling and they say everything you do should be a story. And on the flip side, you have equally as valid arguments saying that's not the point of data visualization or communicating information. It's just to tell the facts. So how can we marry these two opposing ideas together? Now, I don't have the answers. I can tell you what I think. And of course, what I think is right. No, it's not. Um, but I will hopefully be able to tell you and convince you that data storytelling has a real place for anybody who works with information. Now, before we get on to data storytelling, we have to figure out what the hell is a story. If storytelling is telling a story, what is a story? Um, this definition by Levo and Reitz, I really like. It's saying that uh, a story is a mirror that we hold up to the truth to explain that truth to ourselves. Now that sounds a little bit strange. Um, so I'll give you a more concrete example. And for this, I need to pull up my weather app on my phone. So I could, be, I could say to you right now that the temperature outside is, take it at eight o'clock. It's um, a balmy eight degrees, although it feels like five. Um, we have an uh, average wind speed of 16 uh, miles an hour with gusts up to 34 miles an hour. Uh, less than 5% chance of any rain, um, clear skies and 66% humidity. And of course, very low UV, it being night. Now that would be the data, the facts, about what the temperature, what the weather is in London right now. But if I was telling you guys what it's like outside, I'd be saying, it's really nice. It's finally not raining. It's clear, it feels like spring, it's fantastic. And what I'm doing there is I'm holding up a mirror. I'm telling a story about the data of what the current weather in London is. So maybe that brings us into a little bit more context. Storytelling is something we all do all the time to explain facts in the world around us to everybody else and to ourselves. So with that broad um, definition of storytelling, we should be able to go forward and see well, what a story is. We should be able to go forward and see how we can apply storytelling to data. So now we've got an idea of what a story is. Broadly, it's, it's um, interpreting the, the facts and the reality of life around you. What is a story like? How, how broad do we take that definition of a story? So I think most people would agree that this novel, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, is a story. Personally, it's one of my favorites. But most people would say this is a serious novel. It has in-depth characters. It, 
you know, it's a classic Penguin says it's a story because they've put it on one of their books. But I would equally say this is a story. Now this is a quote attributed to Ernest Hemingway, although there are questions about whether he actually said it. But these six words, for sale, baby shoes, never worn. That I think equally tells a story. It's a much shorter story. It, and compared to Pride and Prejudice, is a much more tragic story. But it's a story nonetheless. It's telling a definition of some facts. It's holding a mirror up to the world to explain that to other people. And so if we could, um, in our minds, accept that Pride and Prejudice is a story as much as these six words by Ernest Hemingway is a story, then we can see the definition of what a story is is really broad. And if we apply that to data, we'll be able to see that data storytelling applies not just to huge data journalism pieces. Um, if anyone saw Eyes in the Sky last year, um, looking at um, data around planes that are circling in the US, huge interactive digital piece, interactive graphics, most people would say that was a data story. But equally, we have our day-to-day -day bar charts, and that's more like the Ernest Hemingway story. They're short. They're sweet and they're to the point. And we can apply storytelling techniques to both. So I've been talking a bit about data storytelling and here is a um, definition of it from Tech Target. This is using a slightly more um, corporate lean, but it's saying that storytelling is the process of translating your data into terms that other people would understand. Basically, it's saying storytelling is a way for you to have other people understand your data, to communicate it well and effectively to other people. And that's a, a pretty, I think, um, useful thing to be able to do, no matter what type of data you're looking at, no matter what your end goal, and no matter who you work for or what you do in your job. So here's this idea of what does data storytelling look like. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen, this is the late Hans Rosling, um, his really um, famous TED talk. And this is what I think most people would understand as data storytelling. And I'm going to play it, and hopefully um, everyone will be able to hear in the audio. Um, so this is, I think, what most people would definitely classify as data storytelling. It's like, I lost my mouse. There we go. And decreasing family size. I have to not, not tell you anything, you have to see that for yourself. Huh? This is what happened. Now I stop the world. Here we come now with education, smallpox, better education, you know, health service. You go down there, China comes in into the Western box here, you know, and here Brazil is in the Western box. India is approaching the first African countries coming into the Western box. And we get a lot of new neighbors. Welcome to a decent life. Come on, we don't get one down here. This is the vision we have, isn't it? And look now, the Africa, the first African countries here are coming in. There we are today. There is no such thing as a Western world and developing world. So that was Hans Rosling um, showing uh, the difference, um, well, progression around the world in, in healthcare and child mortality. And I think most people would say that this is storytelling. But what if you want to tell a story and you don't have a big screen and you don't have a long pointer and it's not animated and you're not Hans Rosling who is just a brilliant, brilliant storyteller in any sense of the word? Can you still tell a data story? So this is a visualization looking at, um, in red, the number of women um, who are graduating in the US with um, Bachelor of Science degrees, year and year changes, and in blue, the number of um, men. And this is by um, uh, Tableau Public user, Britt Carver. And I would argue that this is equally a data story telling viz. This is telling uh, a narrative where we've got, um, even though it's single and it's static and you don't have to animate it and there's nobody talking to you about it, she has um, used a few techniques that bring out a real story in this. She's put in annotations to show what's happening. Um, you've got a really uh, good title up there in yellow underneath my main title, um, telling you what this is about and what this is showing. 
I would argue that this is equally as much storytelling as what Hans Rosling did. If Hans Rosling is to Pride and Prejudice, then this visualization by Brick Carver is what those six words by Ernest Hemingway were to storytelling. And so how are we doing this? So we're telling these stories using data by adding these things I'm going to call data narrative techniques. So if you write a story, you have narrative techniques to tell a story. And for data, you can do the same thing. And we'll go through in a second and have a look at, firstly, a quick refresher for English course, what sort of storytelling techniques are and narrative techniques, and then have a look at some of those ones and how they apply to data. But before we do any of that, I've been talking about data storytelling a lot. Why the hell does it matter? Aside from the fact that it means I get to eat some really sweet pizza and talk to you guys tonight, which is lovely. So why does data storytelling matter? Here is a table um, taken out of Wikipedia that looking at the number of firearm related deaths per 10,000 people um, population by country. This is a pretty standard looking data table. It's actually a much more interesting data table than normal because they've got little flags next to it, which are colorful. Um, this has a lot of really poignant information in it and it's telling you some very interesting facts. But presented as such, most people wouldn't pay any attention, well, they might pay attention to them, that's not fair, but they wouldn't take this in and would be very hard pressed to pull any key insights out of it. Now, if we change this and use some data storytelling techniques, we could end up with something like this. This is from the upshot from halfway through last year and it's looking at some very similar numbers. The number of homicides per day um, in the US um, by population size. And you can see the US right up there in the top. It really stands out. And ha at the moment, you'll be thinking this is just a data visualization. But actually, they're using some storytelling techniques here. We can see they've got a, a really good title that tells us what we're looking at. Quite often, if you see a visualization or some information, it doesn't really have a title or it has a, um, a not very informative title. It would be something like uh, number, of, uh, number of units of you know, homicide per country per population or something like that. We also have um, all the country names um, have um, are annotated. We can see what the, the little docs are. And importantly, the US, they've just bolded it. Really simple technique. But by doing that, it draws our eyes to the US at the top and really emphasizes the difference in the data there. So these small storytelling techniques are really changing what would be a simple little scatter plot into something that everyone can understand and understand immediately. So storytelling builds empathy with these numbers. You'd look at that and this will make you your gut wrench. This will make people stand up and pay attention to the, the story that the um, upshot was trying to tell with the data around US homicides. Equally, it makes numbers more memorable. Um, this is looking at the number of measles ca um, cases per 10,000 in the population in the US over time. And each different state in the US is a different line in the line chart. This is a very traditional way of showing um, this information. Um, this is um, uh, on a blog for the software company SAS. And this is, by all means, it's a little fuzzy on the screen, but a good data visualization. Very solid. However, I had to sit there and explain to you what it was showing and what it was about. If you just saw this without the context of the blog it came from, you wouldn't, you'd be a bit hard pressed to figure out what was going on. And also, it's a line chart with a few colors that don't really stand out extremely in it. It's not really eye catching or grabbing and you're not likely to remember it. And if you don't remember information, you're very you're not very likely to act on it or to have it inform any of your future decisions. This was an answer to whoop, this visualization. Sorry, the uh, title is blocking the other title. Um, this is uh, probably one of my favorite visualizations of all time by the Wall Street Journal. 
um, it's looking at exactly the same information, the number of measles cases per state in the US over time. And they're employing the same storytelling technique of putting um, that reference line there. That's when measles, measles vaccination was brought in. But this has a, and it's, apologies for being cut off, this has a really strong title, Battling Infectious Diseases in the 20th Century, The Impact of Vaccines, What's Happening with Measles. They're using bright, strong colours to really contrast between the before and the after. They are using a strong title to tell you what it's about. And they're having a little play on the idea of, um, you know, biology and, and um, uh, vaccinations and, you know, um, biological uh, process. My brain's just gone dead. That was a correct word to say that. But this looks a bit like petri dishes, right? These are like swabs. So by making this, a, a, using some of these small storytelling techniques, a good title, a reference line, strong use of color, and this idea of making it look a little bit different than what you'd expect as a line chart, this is now a much more memorable, I would argue, visualization than the previous one, even though they're showing the exact same information. And this, I think, would be more likely to convince people that vaccinations really do help stop disease. So storytelling makes numbers more memorable, which means you're more likely to remember them and act in them, and they help you build sympathy and empathy with those numbers. It lets you put yourself in the shoes of what the data is telling you. So how do, how do they do this? How do we do this with numbers? I've been going through mentioning things like color and reference lines. What are these things? I'm calling them um, data narrative techniques. And to do this, we'll have a look at Pride and Prejudice again. We'll see some of the things that make that a great story and then see how we can apply the same ideas, same principles to a visualization. So through data visualization, though, that, sorry, though data visualization often compares itself to storytelling, and this is true, we're hearing storytelling everywhere, the relationship between the two isn't often, often clearly explained. People say, it's all about data storytelling. And what I'm hopefully going to show you is a, quite a concrete, what we think of as good storytelling in a novel, a pretty traditional story, can be applied to good storytelling in a data visualization as well. So I'm going to use the example of Pride and Prejudice, because um, it's one of my favorite books. And um, this is a, a brilliant um, image from um, Shmoop. Uh, that explains some of the complexity in Pride and Prejudice. If you're not familiar with it, um, I'm going to give you a quick overview. If you are, apologies if I totally butcher the story for you. Pride and Prejudice um, is set in 18th century England, and it's set around um, some upper class um, landed families. In particular, we have the group of sisters on this side, the Bennets, with Elizabeth Bennet at the top being our main character. And the story revolves around the relationships between Elizabeth Bennet and her sisters and various other people um, in the story. In particular, Mr. Darcy, um, who has a, um, a love-hate relationship with Elizabeth. At the start, they both um, dislike each other. It builds up to a climax where Mr. Darcy asks for Elizabeth's hand in marriage and she turns him down based on various different, um, her pride and prejudice about him and how he's been acting in a very proud and disagreeable way up until then. And the second half of the story, sort of the resolution of this, is uh, how Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy begin to recognize that they were mistaken in their initial opinions of each other. And in true Jane Austen and Shakespeare fashion, it ends with a double wedding. Ultimate happiness, everybody, is a double wedding, apparently. And that double wedding happens between um, Elizabeth's sister Jane and Mr. Darcy's best friend, Mr. Bingley. And these characters on the other side um, help push the plot along, with Mr. Wickham being the main antagonist, the, the person who, um, the bad guy in the story. So that's what Pride and Prejudice is. It's a lot of um, relationships between people and the complexities of them. And I'd say it's a good story. 
And I think most people would think it's a good story, whether they like it or not. And how we might judge it being a good story is because it ha answers each one of these seven um, elements of how to tell a good story. It has a really strong central premise, which is um, a narrative around love, pride, prejudice, and the interactions um, between people and the main characters, Elizabeth and Mr. Darcy. It has really strong characters, as we've just gone through. It's got a good crucible. It really defines the world in which the story is set. That helps us um, understand why things are happening. Has a strong protagonist, Elizabeth Bennet. Has a really strong antagonist. First of all, that starts off being Mr. Darcy and quickly changed to being Mr. Wickham. It has a really well-defined story arc. We go up to the um, first engagement, Mr. Darcy, Mr. Um, and Elizabeth, and then the resolution of those two. And it has conflict, it has tension between the main characters, um, Mr. Darcy and Elizabeth, and also between lots of characters and Mr. Wickham. So it has all the elements of a good story. And how it tells that story is through narrative techniques. Some of the ones they use in Pride and Prejudice is the narrator, which is called a third person omnipresent. In this case, sometimes it's like God looking in, telling you what's happening in the story. Sometimes it's a third person. Jane Austen also uses flashbacks, satire, irony, foils. <coughs> um, she sets a really good scene and uses imagery. All these techniques are narrative techniques. Now, what's important about narrative techniques is they're the vehicle that you use to progress a story. And we can use data narrative techniques to progress our data stories. It's a very similar idea. We're just going to use slightly different ones. So let's have a look at that. So this is a visualization um, that was presented at Maloffier in 2012. Um, and it's telling a story, even though it's a one static visualization. It's looking at the number of um, deaths in the Iraq conflict over time. And it's using a few really key data storytelling techniques here. It's got a strong title. There's no doubt what the author wants you to take away from this visualization. Strong use of color and also an interesting use of chart type. While it's a bar chart, it's rotated around to make it look like blood dripping down. So we've got a title, we've got a chart type, we've got color, and then we have some supporting information around the side. Now if we go back with our Pride and Prejudice data storytelling hat on, we can say those, um, it's using a few different data narrative techniques, color, chart type, title, supporting information, and how those translate to a, a strong story is we have um, our crucible, we've set the tale, we know it's in Iraq, around the Iraq war, so we now have a, a world for this data to live in, and we understand that. We've got a good central premise, deaths in Iraq, and that what we want to take away from that premise, the bloody toll, is told to us very clearly. We have a story arc um, of such. We have, just by the shape of the graph and how it looks, we can see change over time. That's an arc. And we have supporting information. We have supporting strong characters here, which are these little supporting graphs around the outside. So we can begin to see we're using some of the same techniques in this one static visualization that Jane Austen used in Pride and Prejudice and every great storyteller would use while telling a story. And what if we tweak some of these narrative techniques? Can we tell a different story with the same piece of data? And if we, we can, and I'll just go through, completely different story, I'd argue. Same data, same chart actually, but by using a few different narrative techniques, a different title, a different choice in color, and a different orientation of the chart type, we're now telling a very different story with the same piece of information. While both visualizations are powerful and impactful 
and they help you build sympathy and empathy with the data, and they're memorable. I think this is a great example of how different data narrative techniques can really change the meaning and the story you tell with your visualization. So if we see them side by side, it's pretty obvious that a few small changes in how we tell the story can really change the overall impact and the overall story being told by any piece of information. And if you wanted to um, compare this to a real day story, you might want to take Pride and Prejudice. I won't align it with a color. Um, and maybe compare that to a different version of Pride and Prejudice, potentially Pride and Prejudice and Zombies. Very different story, taking the same basic premise, the same characters, going through the same um, set of interactions, but using a slightly different narrative technique, zombies, and we have a completely different story with a completely different impact. So hopefully we've seen that data narrative techniques are really important for how to communicate that information and the impact your visualization um, will have on other people. In the last uh, few minutes, I want to go through and take you through a working example of how you might be able to use this in your day-to-day -day, you know, work, lives, jobs, um, and be able to recognize techniques that other people are using in any visualization you see. So I'm going to open up Tableau because I work with Tableau and it's software I'm most familiar with, but you should be able to, um, this is just an example, and you should be able to do the exactly same thing in any piece of software you usually work with. So what we're looking at here, um, and before I go any further, this um, idea in visualization is originally from um, Ben Jones, who blogs and tweets from Data Remixed. Um, big thanks to him for letting me use it. Um, and this is looking at the number of earthquakes from 1900 through to 2016 with a magnitude six or plus, six or over. And this is the first, this is, before I go, this is not a bad visualization. What I've done here is I've mapped each of those earthquakes out and I've got a filter over here where I can go through and look at different time. Um, won't click it because I have not enabled my background map, so you'll see the differences, but you won't see the map underneath. Um, so we'll just leave it, leave it like that. I'm not connected to the internet. But this would be a, a great starting visualization if you're beginning to try and work through this data set. And that data set is earthquakes around the world since 1900. But when I showed this to my neighbor, my desk neighbor who sits next to me, I was like, hey, Thierry, what does it say to you? And he looked at it and he went, um, what's it about? And I was like, well, that obviously doesn't pass the great data storytelling. Um, rule of thumb. If somebody else looking at this visualization can't understand what I'm trying to show with it, can't understand what it's about, then they definitely won't be able to build any empathy with the data. They won't find it memorable and most likely they will just be confused. So I thought this was a great example for them to be able to go through and go step by step through some of these data story telling techniques and show how you can use them and what data narrative techniques, those ways we tell a story, how we can go from this to something I would want to communicate with somebody else. So what I was looking at here was the change in the number of earthquakes at different magnitudes over time. And if I cl click through all these years, I can find that out, but it's not apparent to everybody else. So the first thing I did was I sat down and I thought, what is the most important, important relationship in the data? Basically, what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to figure out who my, what type of narration I'm going to use. Jane Austen used the third person omnipotent. Um, you can, movies, you have like Blair Witch Project, first person, shaky camera. Um, how, the, how you narrate a story is very important. What you're looking at here is the visual vocabulary by the FT. Um, it's freely available as a PDF. Um, it's a really great resource. And what it's trying to tell you is that just because you have data and you can present it one way, for instance, I had data I could map, earthquakes around the world, 
What you should be looking at, the best way to narrate that data is to figure out what's the key relationship you're trying to show. And the key relationship I was trying to show was change over time. How many earthquakes are happening over time? And for that, it's saying a good way, and I know this is very small, um, but that's saying a good way to show it might be a line chart. Great. So I went back to my visualization and I said, let's build a line chart. And I will just exclude, this is 2017, my half finished year there. So I built a line chart. Ah, now this is getting a bit more obvious. If I started to show this to other people, at least they'll get us trying to show changes over time. Although as of yet, they wouldn't know what those changes were. So the second thing I need to do is I need to think about my premise. What is my key um, point to my story? What am I focusing on in my story? So I'm defining what my data visualization is about. I'm setting my central premise. This is the top thing we need to do to tell a good story. Doesn't matter what type of story that is or what medium you're telling it in, premise is really important. So I went ahead and, this is totally nerdy, I write it above the visualization I'm building or in a notepad. Why? Just helps me focus. So the key thing I'm trying to tell in this visualization is why are there more earthquakes happening over time? And again, I'll filter out my half finished 2017 year just because it drops off like that. So why are there more earthquakes happening over time? Now, one thing I have in here is I have my earthquake magnitude. Um, if you can see very small on the uh, right hand side, I've got six to 6.9 magnitude. I've grouped them together just to make it easier for me to understand what's going on. Seven to 7.9, eight to 8.9 and nine plus. So going from earthquakes will just be out of feel to earthquakes I'll bring down a city. So why the more earthquakes over time? First thing I might want to do is to drag on my magnitude earthquakes and just have a look at that. So now I can see something's happening. This is broken up. I have my, and I'll add this to the labels. So these are a bit small, apologies for that. So I've got my 6.2, 6.9 up here. They seem to be growing exponentially since about early 1960s, 1963 or thereabouts. But my other earthquakes, seven to nine plus, their frequency isn't changing at all over time. It's, it's holding aver about average. So that makes me think, what's happening with these six to 6.9 earthquakes? So now by putting some thought into my narrator, so what type of visualization chart I'm going to use, and sitting here and really thinking what my premise is, I've been able to direct my analysis. So even if I didn't share this with anybody else, these basic data storing te telling techniques were great for me to be able to progress the work I wanted to do. So I grabbed this data down from a US um, seismology website. So I went back onto it and had a look at its history page. And this is from the Albuquerque Seismology Laboratory. And it goes through and it's saying from early 1960s, there started to be a lot more global coordination around earthquake monitoring and reporting. And there were lots of advances in technology about how we can measure earthquakes. So I went, ah, okay. So maybe that's why there are more earthquakes. Magnitude six earthquakes, we don't always, we can't always feel, they might happen in the middle of the ocean and we don't record them. So now we have better technology and a better system of doing this. Maybe that's why we have more earthquakes over time. So now I've defined why there are more earthquakes over time, because we're better at measuring them. And we can see that again, if I just drag this onto detail. Perfect, so we see there's definitely an increase in our six to 6.9 magnitude earthquakes, but nothing else. So this guy can now go on to my second part of my premise, my title. And this is a mixture of my premise, my conflict, and my arch, and I'm taking the idea of a title, I'm stealing it right out of journalism, um, journalists' handbooks. So having a look, um, this was from the FT a few weeks ago, just an example of what 
a punchy title is. And why do we need a punchy title? This really sets the scene for anybody else who's going to look at your visualization. If you think about this, if you're scrolling through on your phone the titles, um, you know, top news today, you can usually figure out what's happening in the world without having to go in and read any of the stories. And why is that? Because journalists clued on a long time ago that titles are amazingly important and they're the easiest possible thing you can do to add to um, in terms of a data narrative technique to um, add storytelling to your visualization. So what they have is a strong title, in this case Bank of England not able to forecast next recession it admits, and then our subhead. So the title restates our premise and the subhead states sort of any conflict or arch, the key takeaway message we want people to get from this visualization. And in this case, from this article, it's the takeaway message was our models are just not that good, top official tells MPs. So I can do this with my visualization. I can add a title to it pretty easily. So I'll go ahead, add a title, and to save you guys having to see me type, I've totally cheated and written it out already. So we'll just make it look a little bit more like a title, make it big. Ah. Okay, so now we have a title. So I've restated my premise. Are earthquakes on the rise? That's restating what else, are there more earthquakes over time? Are earthquakes on the rise? And I've also stated sort of my key findings, my um, sort of key story arc. In this case, luckily they don't seem to be on the rise. Advances in seismology have increased detection of six to 6.9 magnitude earthquakes. Now I turned around to my neighbor, my desk neighbor, Thierry, and I said, now can you tell what this is about? And he's like, ah, oh, earthquakes. Yes, increasing over time. So I could just leave it at that and I would have had changed my original visualization and we'll go back and have a look at it, which was this, which he didn't understand at all what I was trying to show and I'd argue everybody here, unless I explained it to them, wouldn't understand what I was trying to show, even though this was a helpful process for me to think through. To this, which everyone will be able to understand really quickly, even if you did nothing more than read the title and very quickly glance at the chart. So one of our other storytelling techniques is a crucible. Now in Jane, um, Pride and Prejudice, that was, that's the setting. So that was, this is set in 18th century England, upper class landed gentry. So I need to be able to tell everybody what this is. It's quite useful. This is um, earthquakes over time. What earthquakes over how much time? With all this stuff about fake news going on, you need to be able to tell people what your information is covering and what it's not covering. Because that can have a real impact on the final um, takeaway message and what you do in your analysis. So we're going to add a crucible to this. I'm just going to do that by adding a title. Oop. I'll add another title under here. And so this is all my earthquakes over time. And last time I showed this, I was in Tableau mode, so I've got some little Tableau cool tips in here, but we can just even type it in. So this is from 1900 through to 2016, 2016. Cool, so now we've got a title, we've got a crucible, we've set the scene, um, and we've told everybody what this information is covering, what this story encompasses. Now, protagonist. A good story has a strong protagonist. How can we add a protagonist to a data visualization? Your protagonist is your main character, and in any story, you don't have the author at the start going, the main character of Pride and Prejudice is Elizabeth Bennet. You tell that by 
how the story is told, how the, so it's, this is done by a narrative technique, and we can do the same thing um, for our data. We can use things like color, size, shape, these are all called pre-attentive attributes, but these things we see in lots of the other visualizations like Iraq's Bloody Toll, they use color really well. Um, so we can go ahead and highlight who our um, protagonist is by adding color. So I'm gonna go ahead and add some color to this visualization. By default, it's given me these middling blue colors. I really want my main character, which is a six to the 6.9 earthquakes to stand out. So I'm going to make them yellow. Hopefully that will show up well on the screen. Yep, cool, it does. And I could change the color of the other ones, but there we go. So all of a sudden, we can tell who my main character of this visualization is. Main character of this story, the key thing, is the 6 to the 6.9 earthquakes. Now the last thing we do is add the story arc. What's going on? I can do this by adding annotations. So now we've got figured out who the main character is, we've set the scene, we've got our premise, the main point of the story, everyone knows that. But we can add a little bit more context to this visualization to really help people out. And I'm going to do that by adding some annotations. So I'm going to add in 1961, the Albuquerque Seismology Laboratory was established. make it a bit bigger and easier to read. There we go. So I can go ahead and add a few annotations. This is another narrative technique. So we've looked, we've got a few narrative techniques going on. Color, annotations, a title, and the um, uh, visualization type we've used, a line chart in this case. If I go ahead and add all the annotations on, um, a bit small on the screen, but pointed out a few other key things. So we've got a worldwide standardization of um, seismology networks. Um, we've got the global seismology network group formed. And I've called out the fact there's no increase in earthquakes above seven plus. And if we put that all together, this is what we have. We've got a far better story that everyone will be able to tell. And we can add one final narrative technique. Let's really make this pop. I'll make it the same yellow color. So now I can tell my main character, 6.6.9 earthquakes in the title. I can see it in the visualization. And I've transformed what was a confusing mess of dots on a map to something that everybody would be able to understand what I'm trying to show with this data. So hopefully that's been able to show you that data storytelling is an essential, an essential thing to do if you are communicating information to anybody else except for yourselves. And I, I even do it, I at least add half decent titles with some like notes and anything I might look back in six months time at. Because if I look back at that first map with the dots, I wouldn't be able to remember what I was doing, especially because it was just called map. Not at all helpful. So data storytelling techniques help your audience understand what the information is you're trying to communicate. They help them um, build empathy and remember that. And they also help your future selves, if you're like me and a bit scattered sometimes with your file naming. They help you remember what the hell you're doing as well. So everybody, hopefully you should all be telling stories with your information going forward. Thank you.